Right, so we're going to start this course with just a quick introduction to one or two of the problems that we'll be looking at uh, as part of this course. Um, this is based on the preliminary material that you should all have uh, looked at uh, already and, and be reasonably familiar with, so there shouldn't be anything uh, new here. So um, I'll go through it fairly quickly, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, before we get into the, the main part of the course. Okay, so we start with uh, a couple of examples that really illustrate how um, amazing computers are and how uh, computing, uh, particularly modern computing technology, allows us to solve lots of problems that you know would be kind of inconceivable um, without using computers. So the first example here is just sorting uh, a million numbers. Okay, we can just simulate a million random numbers and sort them into ascending order in in the blink of an eye okay so here I've, I've used the system time function in r to time how long this operation takes um don't take the timings too seriously uh, and in particular you'll sometimes see uh, small discrepancies between the timings you observe in the r code and uh, the timings referred to in the text of the notes it's just because every time i rebuild the notes um, all of the computations rerun and the timings change. And so if I write the notes on one laptop and then rebuild them on another laptop, they, they all change, etc. But they should give you just a, a vague idea of how, how big computations are, how long they take, and the relative timings of, of particular operations. Okay, so here's an example of uh, uh, an operation that um, would be kind of inconceivable to do by hand, um, but you can do it in the blink of an eye on a computer. Okay. So here's a, another one. Uh, matrix computations crop up uh, all over the place in statistics and uh, quite a lot of this course, in fact, one way or another is concerned with uh, working with matrices uh, in a uh, reliable, uh, robust and efficient way. Um, and so what can we do with matrices on a computer. Well, the point is we can work with very big matrices very easily, and usually uh, it works out fine. So here's an example. Um, we take a thousand by thousand matrix uh, and we just invert it. Okay, so one of the lessons of this course is that you never ever invert matrices, but you know, let's just ignore that uh, for, for uh, a second and uh, just look at the problem of actually how you would invert a matrix? Well, you can, okay? You can invert a, a thousand by thousand matrix in, uh, again, the blink of an eye, and it's incredibly accurate, okay? So here we um, we can check uh, how, uh, how good our inverse is by uh, multiplying it by the matrix we started with and comparing it to the identity, and we see that it's incredibly close, okay? So um, we can invert a huge matrix incredibly quickly, and you know, if you've never thought about it, um, there are a lot of in there, there are a lot of operations involved in doing a, a matrix inversion like that. This one, when you work it out, uh, actually has around you know two billion uh, arithmetic instructions. Okay, so think how long it would take to do two billion arithmetic instructions by hand, uh, even with a calculator. Um, you know, it's just inconceivable. Okay, so um, computers are very very powerful very, very fast, uh, allow us to do all kinds of things that would be inconceivable otherwise. Uh, and in particular, they allow us to tackle problems that are much, much bigger than the problems we could tackle by hand. But actually, it's not just the size of the problem. Okay, so so those two examples were examples where if you took a small version, you know, you just had a small pile of cards to sort into order, you could do that. Uh, if you just had a very small matrix to invert, you could do that by hand. That would be okay. Uh, but some problems uh, are not kind of limited in, by their size. They're just limited by their complexity. So here's an example of a problem where it's not so much the size of the problem that demands the use of a computer. It's really its complexity. Okay. So this one um, just concerns a, a pretty simple model. Um, it doesn't really matter what it is. It's just a, a simple differential equation model of a uh, population. You know, it's a simple population dynamics model. Um, but the complicating factor is, although it's a fairly simple differential equation, it's written down there. Um, the complexity is that it's actually a delay differential equation. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the derivative here, um, 
it's a first order differential equation, just first order. Uh, but the right hand side of this differential equation depends not only on um, the value of the population at time t, okay, which would be the, the usual thing in a first order differential equation. Uh, the complicating factor is that it also depends on the, the value of the solution at some previous time here, t minus one. Okay, so there's that lag process in the definition of the differential equation, uh, hence the name delay differential equation, and that makes it hugely complex, right? So most of these uh, equations are completely analytically intractable, incredibly hard to approximate. Um, so basically all you can do with them typically is numerically integrate them on a computer. Uh, using methods for numerical solution of differential equations that are properly adapted for working with delay differential equations. Okay, so it's a relatively simple model uh, in terms of, you know, just looking at it and writing it down, but it's incredibly complex from a mathematical point of view, and so we really need a computer to understand its solution. But if you've got a computer, then actually it's easy. All right. So in R, it turns out there is a, a package on CRAN, this package here, um, that we can use for solving delay differential equations. So if you haven't got it installed, you can just install it from CRAN directly and load up the library. And what do you do? Well, you just define the right hand side of your differential equation. So uh, this is a function here we're going to define that's going to contain the right hand side of our differential equation and the details don't really matter um, if you just look at the definition and compare it to the mathematical uh, formulation you'll you'll be able to match up what's going on uh, the key thing is that for describing these delay differential equations you need a way of uh, referring to the past okay the lagged value uh, and and so that's where it uses this um, special past value function that's provided by the package um, but given that, you just define the right-hand side and then you set up the problem with an initial condition, a grid on which you want the solution, etc. You just run the code and you get the solution. Okay, And you can do this reliably. Uh, you can get your solution and again, um, very, very quickly, very efficiently, very accurately. Uh, and it would be pretty much inconceivable to try and generate a solution to a problem like this by hand. You know, it's not that in principle you couldn't do it, right? You can just take the algorithm that the computer is using and execute it yourself by hand in principle, but it would just take so long. There'll be so many operations involved to get anything useful uh, that essentially the computer is the only way we have to study problems like this, okay? So computers, they're fast, they're accurate. They allow us to solve big problems, problems of whose size um, would be challenging for us to deal with by hand and also problems whose complexity would make them very difficult to deal with by hand. So computers are great, okay? They allow us to do all sorts of cool things that we couldn't do otherwise. However, um, there's another side to this story, which is that because computers are so amazing and so fast and so accurate, you might think that every problem is easy, okay? You just take your mathematical understanding of a problem, you turn it into computer code, uh, and you're done, okay? And in particular, I think um, people who've done sort of undergraduate maths courses often come away with that impression that really, uh, if you understand a problem mathematically, somehow turning it into code is trivial. And um, uh, this could could hardly be further from the truth, okay? So uh, for any non-trivial problem, uh, understanding it mathematically is, yes, very important, but turning it into reliable, robust, efficient computer code is an entirely non-trivial problem that requires a whole different set of knowledge and skills. Okay, so what can go wrong? Well, let's just have a look at a few things. Um, Let's look at some problems with matrices. As we've mentioned, uh, matrices crop up all over in statistics. Um, we'll be doing a, a lot of kind of studying how matrices work and how to do things uh, efficiently and stably using matrix computations. Um, so let's generate uh, some big matrices, okay? So we're going to generate some 3,000 by 3,000 matrices. So they're, they're pretty big. Uh, we'll just fill them with uh, with random numbers and a, and a random vector as well of length 3000. And all we want to know is the product ABY. Okay, so the first two 
uh, a and b there are matrices y is a vector so the result will be a vector and we just want to compute a very very simple matrix operation so if we were just to write that in r in the naive way we just write it as a matrix multiply b matrix multiply y okay and we can do that and it works i mean it's not a problem in some sense uh, we get the answer and we get it in a particular time again as i've mentioned don't worry too much about the absolute timings it's the the relative timings that matter um but here's a slightly different way to write the same thing uh, we know that um matrix multiplication is associative okay that's one of the properties that matrix multiplication has so we know we should get the same answer by uh the the, the top approach there would uh, we would say we fold from the left okay and in this bottom approach we're, we're folding from the right so we're doing b times y first and then we're pre-multiplying the result by a okay so we just put brackets around the b and the y and it's the same calculation you get the same answer okay to essentially machine precision though that isn't necessarily guaranteed um but one is much much faster than the other okay so this is um a, just your first example of yeah mathematically you just want a b y but whether you write it in computer code as a b y or a brackets b y uh, really makes a difference to how fast that code executes okay and um we'll see other examples where it can really affect the accuracy of the results etc okay so so it matters how you write the code so taking your kind of mathematical understanding and turning it into code uh, there are choices that you make when you turn it into code and those choices matter okay so throughout these notes um uh, I'm occasionally using this function system time to um, to time how long a particular operation takes. Um, that is not a good way in general to to benchmark uh, code, uh, particularly you know relatively fast executing functions like we're doing here, uh, things that take less than a second. Using system time is not a great idea because there are all kinds of reasons why the exact amount of time a function takes will will vary from uh, you know from run to run um you know memory allocation deallocation garbage collection um bytecode compilation there are all sorts of things going on uh, behind the scenes that that can affect the precise timing of a function so normally when you want to time how long a function takes you need to do it multiple times and take an average or the total time to do it you know n times etc uh, and so there are there are lots of packages built into our uh or on CRAN for doing this sort of thing. Um, I'm here going to illustrate uh, this uh, this package R benchmark because it's it's very simple and easy. It's not necessarily the the best or most up to date, uh, but just to illustrate the fact that um, we don't have to use the system time function to uh, to time how long functions take, we can do something a little bit more sophisticated. So this is an example of how you do this timing uh, a little bit more reliably using the uh, R benchmark package. Uh, you just load up the package and then you use this benchmark function to define the functions you want to benchmark against one another. So here we're benchmarking two. One we're going to call ABY, which is the naive way of doing it or the the right folding method of uh, sorry, the left folding method of doing it. Okay, so that's just your ABY. And then we've also got a brackets by, which is this this right fold version. Okay, so we say, okay, uh, how many replicates do we want? Uh, it defaults to 100, I think, but here we'll just do 10 just to illustrate um, how the function works. And you can say various things that you want. So I've just given a selection here of the, the things you're most likely to want. Um, and it presents your results in a little table. Yeah, so it does your functions uh, well here 10 times because that's what we asked for. It gives you the elapsed time. It also gives you some other uh, measures of time. Um, the wall the wall clock elapsed time is probably the thing you're most interested in. And so here is uh, relative, which is the, the comparison of the, the elapsed times. And what do we see? Well, we see that the um, the right fold version is roughly 14 times faster than the left folding version. Okay, so it really does matter um, how 
you write down that matrix operation and you can't just assume that somehow the computer is magically just going to do the best thing and the right thing and uh, the the most efficient most stable uh, way of solving the problem um, computers really aren't quite that clever yet and so uh, you have to do the work of thinking about uh, what is the best way of turning the thing I'm interested in into computer code okay so that's the benchmark package I'll maybe use it one or, or two more times um, but whenever you see me using system time just bear in mind the fact that that's not a good way uh, to really do benchmarking properly um, you should probably use one of these benchmarking packages for doing it better okay so what other issues are we going to be looking at as part of this course well a bit later on we're going to be looking at doing calculus by computer uh, both the differential and integral calculus uh, that crops up a lot so very often in an optimization for example we want to um, work out gradients uh, maybe maximizing a likelihood would be an obvious example in statistics but there are plenty of other reasons why we might be interested in gradients so if you've got a very complicated function you might not know it's analytical derivative so what might you do well the most obvious thing to do might be to calculate um, a numerical derivative uh, using a finite differencing approach yeah and so probably most of you have seen this kind of thing before you kind of take the the basic uh, definition of a uh, derivative as a, a limit and um, evaluated a, a finite increment delta okay so we know that uh, as delta goes to the zero this should tend to the derivative uh, but if we pick a small delta then hopefully um, that will be a good approximation to the derivative that we're interested in okay but what we're going to see is that um, whilst mathematically we uh, we would just want to take this delta smaller and smaller and the smaller we take it the better our results will be we'll see that in practice when we do this on a computer um there's sort of um a delta that's just right that that gives us the best approximation if you make delta too small uh, we start having problems okay so uh, that's that's interesting and so how do you choose that uh that finite difference interval what might be a, a good canonical choice we'll we'll look at that a little bit later Okay, so we'll try this out on a very simple function that we know and understand well. So we're actually going to differentiate, um, well, sine x, in fact, not, not cos x. So we're going to try differentiating sine x. So we're going to start out with a, a sequence of x values. Um, doesn't really matter what they are. Um, we need to choose our finite difference interval. Uh, so here we're just choosing that to be 10 to the minus 5. Then we're going to form our numerical derivative of the sine function. Okay, so that's this thing here. And we're going to define it as being uh, our definition above. Okay, so it's just the difference of the, the values uh, evaluated at adjacent grid points divided by that finite difference interval. Okay, now here we know the, the true answer. You know, we know what the actual mathematical derivative of the sine function is, so we can see how well that we're doing. Okay, so here we know that the derivative of sine x is actually cos x, so we can just compare our numerical derivative with the truth, and that will give us our error. Okay, so we've got our function sine x, um, we've got its true derivative cos x, and we've also got our finite difference approximation. Okay. Okay, so this looks pretty good. We can see our sine curve, we can see our numerical derivative, um, and we can see it compared with cos, and we basically can't see a difference on that scale. Um, however, when we look at the error we see that there is some error okay but it's a very small error if you look at this y-axis here it's order sort of 10 to the minus 5 then you think oh that's quite interesting because um, my finite difference interval was 10 to the minus 5 so by choosing that small value of 10 to the minus 5 i've got a very small error okay so that that's all good and that all makes perfect sense uh, so then you might think well Presumably, if I make my finite difference interval smaller, I will get smaller error. Okay, well, so let's just try that and see. So if we instead use a finite difference interval of 10 to the minus 15, what happens? Well, in fact, what happens is um, not good. 
Okay, so now when we look at our numerical derivative compared with the true derivative, which is cos, we'll see that you know it really doesn't look so great at all. And when we look at the error, we see it's uh, it's uh, pretty horrible. Okay, we've got error, and if we look at the scale on the the y-axis here, we see this is now much much bigger error than we had when we had a finite difference interval of 10 to the minus 5. So actually making our finite difference interval smaller has made our error not only not better but actually much much worse. Okay, So it was much better to use a finite difference interval of 10 to the minus 5 than a finite difference interval of 10 to the minus 15. Um, and so something has gone wrong and, and you know we will look into what has gone wrong and why and, and how to fix that. Okay, so that's a, a little kind of taster of, of uh, numerical differentiation. Um, how about another thing that can go wrong? We've, we've already mentioned that um, matrix computations crop up all over in statistics. Um, one place they crop up is in regression problems. So let's have a look at what can go wrong with a regression problem. So if we um, simulate some data, so here here um, we see some simulated data. Um, we'll see the model in a second. It's just you know, quadratic plus noise. Okay, very very simple uh, model for some simulated data, and we're just going to fit a regression model to it. So that sounds like a pretty simple thing. So uh, here's an, how we've actually simulated the data. Um, so you can see that this line that constructs y here shows you what the true quadratic model is. Yeah, so there is a true quadratic plus some noise. Okay, so that's all we've done. So that's all fine. Um, we, we've also we've chosen our x values to to make this slightly problematic. Yeah, so we've we've shifted our x values along, but still um, we've got some x values, we've got some y values. Um, it's a simple quadratic model, so let's fit it. Okay. So if we know that the model is quadratic, as we do here, then we know that when we fit our model, we should fit a quadratic model. And we can do that um, as a linear model as long as we include a quadratic term in that linear regression model. So um, you presumably know that in R, the uh, function LM fits a linear model, and we can use this uh, indicator notation to uh, construct um, our polynomial terms. So this will fit um, a quadratic model for us, so that's all good. Uh, so what happens when we fit this quadratic model? Well, using the LM command, it actually works perfectly. So what we've shown here are the, the fitted values for uh, our fitted quadratic model, and it's it is kind of the it's the correct least square solution. So obviously it doesn't correspond exactly to the truth that was used to simulate the data, but that that's not a problem. Uh, but this is the least square solution. So LM here has correctly uh, computed the least square solution. Okay, so that's great. Um, why is there a problem? Well, if you've done a first uh, regression course, you might uh, still be under the uh, uh, illusion that regression coefficients are computed by computing x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Okay. Um, well, what we're about to see is that that is in fact not the case. Okay. So uh, if we actually compute that uh, in in R the way we would normally compute that, well, we can uh, get the model matrix for that model. Okay. That's going to be x, and we can take x transpose x and solve it um, against x transpose y. Okay, so this is how you would uh, compute x transpose x inverse x transpose y using R. But you see that when we do that, uh, it fails with an error and tells us that our system is singular. So there are two interesting things there. So one is that um, these kinds of matrix computations can go wrong. Okay, um, But at least it's told us that, it, that it's gone wrong. Um, but it's also telling us that that's clearly not what LM is doing, yeah? Because if that's what LM was doing, then LM would have failed as well, okay? So not only is LM not doing that, LM is clearly doing something much better because not only has it solved the problem, it's solved the problem correctly, okay? So what is LM doing that's different uh, and why is that better? So we, we will look at that. Um, but on the other hand, I wouldn't want you to get the idea that somehow LM is perfect, okay? So. We actually made this problem more tricky by shifting the x values. Okay, so if we shift the x values for more, we actually make the problem um, well ill-conditioned. We'll we'll say what we mean by that uh, 
later on. Um, but we can make it more ill-conditioned by shifting the X values a little bit further. So if we shift them a little bit further and try LM again, uh, we get this bit here which is particularly worrying because it hasn't failed and given an error, right? So in, in some sense, if it fails and gives an error, then you know there's a problem. But here it hasn't failed, it hasn't given an error, it's quite happily given as a solution, but we can see that that solution is incorrect. That is not the, the quadratic that, that we hope to get, okay? So LM has not failed, it's, it's fitted the model, it's given us the fit, it hasn't given us any indication of any problem. Uh, but the solution it's got is clearly incorrect, okay? So LM can fail as well, um, and, you know, that's something to be aware of. So we need to be aware of the fact that matrix computations can fail. There are different ways of doing matrix computations. Some are much better than others, but, you know, some matrix computations are just hard, and you need to be aware of that. Okay, so that was really all I wanted to cover in this uh, this first uh, little lecture. Um, it should all be pretty familiar to you already because you, you should have uh, gone over it in the preliminary material. If, if for some reason you didn't, then you probably do want to go through that material um, again now uh, and make sure you, you do understand it and do have a go at some of the exercises that were associated with that preliminary material because it will really help you kind of uh, engage with the rest of the course. Okay, and so that's it for now. Uh, next up will be um, a chapter on matrix computations. Yeah, so this example uh, that we've just looked at is an example of doing matrix computations and understanding that matrix computations are not always easy, uh, not always numerically stable. Um, so how can we do matrix computations in an intelligent way to make sure that they're fast, efficient, accurate, stable, etc. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks.